Thanks so much for tuning in to Talking Point. I'm your host, Neeraj Shah. Our guest today, uh, way back in the month of April or May, sometime around that time, when he joined on this very show, had mentioned that COVID was not the pin that would prick the bubble, but it's actually the accelerator that the world economy needed, or indeed the Indian economy needed. Those words were prophetic in that sense. The question is, has that changed now that we are in the midst of the second wave with the possibilities of God knows how many waves coming up. And what does that do, if at all, uh, to the market's thinking? Because frankly, while we're in the midst of or just out of a very severe second wave, the equity markets have gone about unfazed, and maybe rightly so. Uh, let's call in the guy who actually spoke about it in, in that way in the last time. Ravi Dharamshi is the one that I'm talking about. He needs no introduction, joins us on the show today. And Ravi, that's my question. That's how I'm starting off. While those words turn out to be true, and I hope everything is fine, by the way, with you and family, what is your sense right now about uh, what kind of issues or what kind of opportunities can this health care around India uh, create for the investing fraternity? Yeah. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, for, at the outset, let me uh, wish you, your family, and your viewers and your family safety and hope they are in the pink of health. Uh, we are in the midst of a human tragedy. So talking about economy and market sounds a little bit out of touch and inhuman, but uh, such is life and uh, markets being the discounting mechanism that they are of future cash flows, they don't have a human or an emotional side to it. So taking that into account, uh, let's go right to your question. So I think uh, as we spoke last time, clearly COVID was an accelerator of trends and not the needle that pricked the bubble. But uh, uh, second wave of COVID is even less so. And uh, the reason I am saying this is because when the first time around it happened in the February, month of February, uh, we were completely taken by surprise. And I'm talking about surprise from the market's point of view. I'm not talking about uh, uh, the, actually everybody was surprised, whether it was the government or uh, uh, any health uh, healthcare uh, worker, everybody was taken by surprise, had no idea what to expect. It was a complete lockdown versus what is happening right now is maybe partial and local. Uh, there was no vaccine in sight at that point of time. Today, there are eight, 10 options of vaccines available. Yes, there are supply constraints, but uh, it is not like... Uh, it is going to remain like this forever. In a couple of months time, even the vaccine situation will ease. Also, besides the vaccine, there are other drugs and other tools that will be available soon enough in this battle against COVID. So, uh, and the second level thinking that uh, was missing in during the first wave was that uh, a huge, uh, the central banks and the governments will provide a safety net, a stimulus to get the uh, economy moving. So uh, first wave was totally unexpected, immeasurable, and no idea how long the duration it would be. The second wave, on the other hand, is expected, it's measurable, and we have some idea of how long this will last. So the impact on the markets incrementally reduces to that extent. And in fact, I will go a step further to say that there will be no third wave. Now, I'm not saying that the virus is going away. What I'm saying is from markets point of view, there will not be a third wave, so to say. Uh, obviously, the healthcare uh, infrastructure needs to prepare for the worst, and uh, the, but that does not mean that the economic impact of that will happen. I think incrementally, I mean, I'll, the same example I'll give the last time I gave, Brexit in 2014 was a big issue. By the time it happened in 2019, actually, the Brexit was far less of an issue and market did not even think twice about it. So that's exactly what is going to happen. And if at all, there is a third wave. Uh, in fact, uh, medically, I believe even the third wave can become less likely as, you know, there is a very promising drug that is on the line that can actually take care of the pandemic. Uh, fill us in, you are a pharma expert. Just very quickly, what is this drug that you are referring to? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, there's a drug called Molnupiravir. Uh, it is being talked about Natco. as the uh, Natco is one of the few uh, ones, but it, it has not had a tie-up uh, with uh, 
Merck, which is the innovator. Uh, so there are other five companies that have signed a licensing pact with Merck. But uh, the point being that this drug, Molnupiravir, is an orally uh, administered drug as against remdesivir, and it is known to remove the infectiousness and disease from uh, the phase two clinical trials done by 100% by the day uh, day five. And it is not a drug that is very difficult to manufacture. All we need is scalability. So uh, if you can identify identify a person with COVID early in the stage, then a simple drug therapy, a five day course of taking two pills per, per day can cure you of COVID. And this, uh, I am hoping that government of India approves this drug and the trial, uh, phase three trials data is encouraging enough, just like phase two. Phase two was conducted on ferrets, and ferrets have the same uh, lung structure that uh, humans have. So there is a high hope that uh, this drug will eventually see the light of the day, and it will be very effective on non-hospitalized COVID patients. So if that were to happen, so now to just to give you an example, if one person in your family gets infected, all the rest of them can take that particular drug as well to prevent the infectiousness. One person got contracted, he will be cured in five days, while others might not get infected at all. So this is one more uh, uh, weapon in our armory to deal with this uh, virus, along with vaccines and many other things. We are also augmenting the infra, uh, healthcare infra and oxygen and ICU beds and pediatric ICU beds. So what I am saying is the third wave, we will be way better prepared than we were for the second wave. And we will have better arms and ammunition to deal with this crisis. OK. So well, cross all 20 fingers for that. In fact, 40 if the two of us are put together, right? Let's cross absolutely, all of them. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So so Ravi, um, uh, from, a, from an investing perspective, last year, right? the differentiating factor between economies, um, governments, nations, what have you, was was because everybody was on the same footing when it came to COVID per se. I mean, how they dealt with it, lockdowns is separate, but nobody had more vaccines or less vaccines, so to say, right? Everybody, Nobody was vaccinated. And therefore, the amount of stimulus that the central bank or the government or combined could give was probably the differentiating factor. Hmm. This time around, even the quantum of vaccination done is a bit of a differentiating factor, right? So mm. how do you view the, we, we'll get to the micro Ravi in a bit, because I would want to talk to you about how are you doing stock picking in such a scenario, because mm. that's my principal interest. But I still want to understand from you, how are you looking at the macro too, uh, when it comes to this perspective? Right. So you're absolutely right. Uh, so last time around, the amount of damage the, that would be caused to the economy was an unknown and governments took some time to realize but uh, i think they acted fast enough and provided all the necessary uh, support that the economy needed obviously now it is very clear that some of the developed economies have probably overstimulated and we are seeing that in the inflation that is happening across uh, assets asset classes materials everywhere essentially the uh, money is getting devalued against every asset and everything. So, uh, uh, so to that extent, the response in the second wave or going forward is going to be measured. See, in March, the, there are very few times in the markets when the odds are so much in your favor that you know one should not use the thimble as uh, Warren puts it. You should use a bucket when it is pouring. So, but obviously now 15 months down the line of, uh, after a fantastic rally and fantastic returns, the odds are not the same that they were in March 20. So, uh, but that is not to say that we are on the verge of an imminent crash. So I think uh, the central banks and the governments of the world will still continue to keep their policies loose, still continue to stimulate the economy. They will keep focusing on the data uh, of job creation and they will try and ignore the inflation threat uh, as they have already put it, it's transitionary. Now, I'm, I have no way of uh, saying that whether this is transitionary or not. But my job is to look at what Fed is doing and what Fed is, or for that matter, any other central bank is doing is looking through this inflation. So I will keep looking out for uh, danger signals from bond markets uh, if there are any. 
but uh, even after such huge stimulus in round 1 where uh, we are all, already you know touching the world war 2 kind of proportions uh, the bond yields world over have barely reached the pre pandemic level or in fact some of them are still in the negative territory so i don't see panic uh, everywhere especially in the bond market so i i feel if the inflation was to manifest itself it will first get reflected in the bond markets and then equity markets will react to it at this point of time mm. i don't think bond markets are uh, reacting to it as well so just to uh, you know, sorry just to sum it up 2013 to 19 was a clean up phase we were kind of stuck in this vicious cycle where the economy was just not reviving one after mm. the other even the steps taken to reform the economy were turning out to have a negative short term impact whether it was demonetization or uh, gst or uh, rera ibc uh, all these steps were having a negative short term impact on the uh, economy now right. the, those short term negative impacts are out the in corporate india is deleveraged like i don't think it has ever been in the past uh, at least last three decades so uh, loose monetary policies delevered uh, india inc and uh, corporate tax cut and growing profitability the corporate profit to gdp which fell to below 1% is now rising since last three quarters and it is slated to go higher in that kind of a scenario uh, i uh, one has no choice but to stay bullish from a medium term point of view but having said that the odds are not the same they were in march you of one cannot not. rule out a six month kind of a correction consolidation and whether it is a rotating one or it happens across the market remains to be seen yeah so just one quick follow up ravi uh, the first alpha moguls that you did with us you had mentioned that uh, you you would use the term we but essentially speaking about you and your breed if you're so focused on stock picking and money making that at times you lose sight of the macro and it's when the macro comes and slaps us hard is when we realize that oh my god you know this should have been paid heed to you don't Absolutely. foresee such a uh, such an issue as things stand right now valuation uh, wise also i absolutely uh, agree to that point yes when we still have one eye on the macros as well as the valuation but i don't think it is panic quarters yet and uh, one should still be focused on uh, stock picking so uh, i think uh, markets were behind the curve in anticipating uh, the kind of uh, profit growth that was on the horizon i mean Uh, you can see from the so for last eight years the earnings estimate were constantly being uh, you know uh, we were getting disappointed and the uh, earnings estimate were hardly being met for the last three quarters the surprise on the earnings estimate is so huge that it has never been such a big uh, surprise in the estimate so clearly market was behind the curve in estimating the profits and those profits are now coming through the fundamentals still remain strong. probably market might have moved now a step ahead of the fundamentals but there is nothing uh, to say that fundamentals are going to turn for the worse or that markets are so far ahead that there is a, a you know kind of a uh, capital destruction kind of a, a risk on the horizon and the biggest factor i'm again pointing out india inc is deleveraged the utilization levels are yet to reach Uh, a level from where they you know start announcing huge capex the economic cycle once put into motion it is difficult to pull it back i mean if this uh, profit cycle continues for another 2 3 quarters you will see spate of announcements from across sectors on uh, cap- capital uh, capital expansion and that will be the sign you need the corporates need that 6 8 quarters of profitability under their belt before they start announcing expansion and we can see that in a couple of quarters uh, but it will happen uh, across many more sectors uh, just to uh, add to that this government's policy of pli the production linked incentive scheme i think is uh, just providing one of the best environment there has been for a corporate not only are we restricting imports we are also providing support domestically to uh, achieve scale now this is as nilkant mishra has uh, already pointed out this has never been the case we have al- always and always incentivized remaining subscale this is the first time that companies are being incentivized to achieve scale 
to become globally competitive so this will have its impact today two three quarters are uh, two three sectors are of the uh, track but in uh, due course about 12 to 15 sectors will be in the same uh, race and there will be champions emerging out of each of those sectors over the next 5 years yeah that'll be beautiful to see frankly i mean uh, that and and plus the fact that it's production linked so it's not that you're giving an incentive for setting up a factory and then you don't i mean then the person is not accountable you're taking the benefit you produce you give employment all of that is just fabulous let's see uh, how it works it's working well for the mobile phones thus far so ravi therefore my question uh, is um how are you if you are not worried about uh, a macro scare or you don't believe that valuations have turned so out of whack that it should worry you my question to you then therefore is how are you how are you playing if i can use that term your portfolio currently is the portfolio currently tilted towards uh, the tried and tested uh, beautiful names with but maybe with rich valuations or are you going for value because traditionally you are a value investor as much as i know you and within that too are you going for the unlock trade now that we've been in about a month month and a half a lockdown and we might very soon be out of that and that is where actually there are bombed out valuations if you will so what's the current portfolio or stock picking strategy right so just to put a little bit nuance to the outright bullishness uh, that uh, that seem to be coming out of the conversation i am not saying that uh, there are risks at this point of time and the risks are more of uh you overestimating or uh, extrapolating the current trends into the future or you uh, taking a bet on a company that you know it, it is not everybody's cup of tea to scale up so there will be few winners uh, not everybody is going to remain a permanent uh, permanently uh, good investment so you need to uh, be very careful about the stocks that you pick going forward having said that uh, because the profit cycle is improving Uh, corporate profit to gdp which went below 1% in march of 20 is now probably between 2 and 3% and is likely to r- rise to 5 to 6% and probably exceed the previous high of 7% in 2000 uh, that was made in 2008 it will exceed in the next 4 5 years uh, so when when the profit cycle is rising it happens it so happens that the uh, pie expands as well as the number of sectors that are participating in it also expand so the opportunity from that point of view is expanding uh, i i three years back and i mean you know there were 10 12 15 stocks that were doing well and only those companies were uh, being touted as the quality and those were the stocks to focus on but now you can see if the number of companies that are reporting fantastic results is probably run into hundreds if not uh, you know almost like 2 300 companies would have given fantastic results and the absolute valuation uh, was very very cheap so the opportunities are there but the risks also are there in the terms in terms of you have to be really correct in your stock picking it is not that uh, you go and blindly place a bet on the last company that is yet to perform in the sector and suddenly that will start doing well there is a risk of uh, you uh, probably giving too much importance to the near term profits there is a risk of little bit of valuations if uh, uh, you know it is a cyclical and not a structural theme so you need to be very sure of the sustainability of earnings the quality of earnings as well so uh, i'm sorry i forgot the second part of your question no no so you actually answered my question very well ravi let me do a follow up to that now so therefore the follow up is that if indeed uh, at the current juncture it becomes so important to be able to pick the right player even within themes which are doing well can i try and ask you about a few themes and maybe you can illustrate uh, within that theme uh, if you already have something in your portfolio or you like something etc just from an illustration perspective because i would love our viewers to understand how is it that you are thinking about going out and picking those stocks now uh, a standard disclaimer viewers to all of you who are listening right now whatever ravi says he may have bought it in his portfolio or his client's portfolio 6 months back 9 months back 12 months back or yesterday we are not going to get into that conversation this is not a stock picking forum this is essentially just to try and understand uh, how is it that he is thinking about the themes ravi if that is fair enough with you can i ask you about a few themes sure sure 
so uh, uh, thanks for that elaborate disclaimer and i'll just add my bit to it it is safe to presume that we have vested interest in all the stocks that we might discuss it is purely for illustration and example purpose as a, as a case study and not uh, any kind of a recommendation okay so let's talk about unlock right um, unlock uh, if indeed we believe that the unlock will unlock uh, theme will play out over the course of the next 2 3 months bfsi autos real estate what have you the three rate sensitives uh, how are you going about judging these are there companies within that that or ancillaries within that that you are betting on and and give us an idea about how how, how are you honing down uh, on or narrowing down on a particular company so i think uh, neeraj when we spoke the last time around at that point uh, i was a little skeptical on the financials uh, i was uh, actually worried that uh, uh, essentially the npas were the balancing factors uh, whatever losses could, could not be borne by the entrepreneur or the government or the um, uh, you know in cost cutting will all be passed on to uh, banks so to say but what we have seen yeah. is that the profit cycle ended up being so strong that the banks did not face the kind of npa issue that one would have expected and and that is also partly due to the fact that most of the india inc had actually deleveraged uh, prior to that and most of the what rbi did beautifully was make sure that the banks capitalized themselves properly so a uh, com- combination of the factor that the banks balance sheet were uh, properly uh, capitalized and the npa cycle didn't turn out to be i remember uh, you know uday kotak making a statement that uh, the banking system is about 100 lakh crores out of which 4 to 5% is likely to become an npa now that was an estimate of 4 to 5 lakh crore or uh, so instead of that 4 to 5 lakh crore we are probably going to end up closer to a lakh crore or maybe just above that so that is the huge uh, change that happened and that is why the fin- financials rallied fantastically uh, la- from september october onwards so now again if the unlock trade was to pan out the first uh, trade usually is the financials an economic boom is going to be preceded by a boom in the uh, credit cycle so we are not yet seeing uh, the credit pick up the way it should happen it is still at an aggregate level it is still uh, you know only 6 7% kind of a growth but if you go scratch beneath the surface you can probably see that uh, corporate sector lending is probably upwards of 10 12% the good banks are willing to grow already growing at 12 15% uh, so that tells you that uh, the corporate lending cycle is coming back and i i believe financials would be a good way to play the unlock trade and uh, it ties in very very well with the first uh, a point that i made that i don't think we are going to witness a third wave so if that is the case and in 6 to 9 months time we are going to have a fully functioning economy i think markets will be willing to see through the next 3 uh, to 4 months of uh, difficulty and discomfort and start focusing on what happens when the economy opens up so uh, i would prefer uh, definitely prefer financials uh, to play the opening up uh, there are other businesses like uh, uh, restaurant tourism and uh, travel those are all the most impacted sector but there are not too many plays available on uh, in, in our markets to you know start betting on those so i think the best proxy for the economy rebound remains uh, financials okay uh, what about what about um, what about real estate uh, how does one do that because that's a sector that has got tremendous um, how do i say impetus in the government as well right not only is rera out there and maybe hopefully effective but the stamp duty cuts etc and all of that so do you play pure play real estate or do you play ancillaries uh, and i believe you probably have some ancillaries in your portfolio as well so can you tell us a bit about how are you going about analyzing this right right so yeah thanks for uh, pointing that out real estate is definitely something that we are bullish on but the our reason for bullishness is not purely uh you know so to say opening up of the economy there are many things uh, that have happened in this particular sector so uh, this sector went through a gst demonetization rera ilnfs crisis uh so uh, and then add to that covid so there have been like one crisis per year in the last 5 years for this sector and if uh, you a company has managed to survive all of those then that speaks 
volumes about that particular company the uh, consolidation in this particular sector is the highest uh, amongst most uh, sectors i think uh, the competition is reduced to the extent of uh, bottom 50 60% of the uh, market uh, the, the competitors being wiped out and you can see that in the new launches that are happening even though there is uh, you know stimulus being given by state government as well as central government to revive the uh, real estate sector the new launches are being announced by very very few players there is still a lot of uh, inventory left that remains to be absorbed but i believe if this current pace of absorption sustains uh, then in 18 to 24 months time i think we'll have a new boom in real estate also pending and uh, uh, usually uh, stock markets tend to lead the real estate boom but real estate boom uh, tend to stay longer than the stock market boom so uh, uh, coming to how we are playing it i, I believe uh, we believe that uh, the better business models or the better risk reward was available in some of the ancillary sectors the building materials the uh, home improvement sector uh, so if uh, if a sector has grown at double digits in the worst of period then you can imagine what happens if the times are going to be good that's exactly what's happened in the pipe sector so the last decade's growth rate in pipes uh, was 15% cagr but the first half of the last decade was 20% growth and the second half was 10% growth so now if the uh, real estate actually picks up at least in volume terms then the we can hope that the sector can grow at uh, somewhere between 15 and 20% so if uh, sector is going to grow at 15 20% and the number of players are reducing even in this particular sector so uh, the top 5 6 players like astral prince uh, uh, ashirwad finolex supreme Uh, these are some of the players that that are taking away the market share not only from the absolute unorganized player but also from uh, some of the organized players who have gotten themselves into trouble because of their real estate exposure uh, uh, like uh, jain irrigation skipper uh, there are many such examples where the players are literally sidelined uh, during this boom and uh, coming to the uh, th- there is also the added tailwind of the government focus uh, there are a couple of schemes of government that aid this sector for example the jal jeevan mission and uh, the atmanirbhar so the uh, duty that is being imposed on the import of C- uh, pvc is resulting in the supply chain disruption for the smaller guys while the larger guys have their supply chain secure and they are able to pass on the cost increase as well this is leading to a not only a fantastic growth but a big boom in the a uh, b- big expansion in the margins as well so clearly uh, uh, real estate uh, is there are many ways to play real estate you can play it through a financier you can play it through a home improvement we actually picked up a couple of uh, uh, home improvement uh, plays yeah so i know just wondering uh, a quick thought and i don't know if you may choose not to answer this ravi but i'm still asking you uh, because i know that you guys bet on prince pipes there are multiple other companies available right astral supreme a smaller one like apollo pipes which is using the apl apollo infrastructure why choose a prince i mean i'm just trying to understand the logic behind uh, choosing a particular investment so clearly astral is the leader and astral is the triple a rated player in the sector uh, uh, obviously but w- 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 one of the dharma of uh, investor is also to assess the odds the odds or the this particular bet was so mispriced Uh, uh in favor of prince as in uh, it was available really at a throw away valuation so astral is probably uh, you know kind of uh, uh in in a league which is above prince but at the same time it is not so so much apart that uh, you value the next best competitor at uh, you know 10% of its valuation so astral was available at 26000 crore market cap which is probably now more to 30 plus 1000 crore market cap while well, prince was available at uh, closer to 2000 crore market cap and today it is closer to almost 8 and a half 9000 crore market cap so uh, this is uh, this is something that we have done in the past also in the way back in 2010 the similar kind of uh, mispricing was there in exide versus amar raja and uh, uh, a number 2 player which is half of the number 1 player was valued at 1/10th of the number 1 player 
and then you saw that market share was actually being gained by the number two player so in this case also prince is actually quite beautifully positioned because uh, they did the ipo at the right time where they deleveraged themselves and they put up the capacity it is one of the only players that is going to have the benefit of expanded capacity over the next 12 months also the fact that lubris are tied up with them uh, gave that added uh, booster and benefit uh, in terms of branding in terms of supply chain security in terms of uh, improving their product mix towards cpvc so as in this pipe sector essentially what you are trying to bet on is the cpvc uh, where uh, astral has the superior product mix however uh, uh, prince was uh, prince will have a faster growth uh, better improvement in the return ratios and cash flows and uh, there was also uh, kind of a negative perception about the company because of some corporate past corporate governance issues so there were all good reasons why uh, it was available at those valuations but now incrementally those issues are being put to rest and that is why market is actually re-rating and reducing the gap between the two players and that is that is our rational for picking uh, the no strong number two players versus the identified number one player yeah but the beauty about this is that uh, it, it gives an insight into how the same theme could or the same a strategy could be deployed in so many other places as well um you, ravi you you have a very good handle on pharma i mean i'm not saying you don't have a handle good handle on others which is why you're doing what you're doing with your portfolios but in pharma in particular I, i've seen you over the years uh, pick out some terrific winners how are you watching how are you viewing this space currently because uh, not only it's divided into multiple facets now with healthcare being such a large pocket and diagnostics hospital chains all of them gaining prominence because of covid but within pharma too this whole big distinction that has happened between say uh, i mean if i can use that term pure play pharma companies established names like sun uh, uh, cipla aurobindo etc versus uh, the api players who are also doing other businesses uh, cdmo stroke biologics stroke others uh and and you know and, and and the stock prices are there for everybody to see the gains have happened too so make it simple for us how are you from the current juncture watching pharma what is it that you believe uh will create wealth and I, again strictly i'm not getting into a point of where did you buy it i'm just trying to understand how do you see the wealth creation opportunity here on no uh, point well taken uh, absolutely uh so pharma is uh, not the homogeneous sector that everybody believes there are pockets there are pockets like api plays available there are uh, uh, biologics play available there is uh, a us uh, specialty complex play uh, specialty generic play available there are uh, domestic pharma plays available so it's a mix of lot of different types of opportunities that are out there in the pharma space La for uh, what we have bet on in the last uh, year or so is one is obviously the revival in the us uh, generic market and second is we have bet on uh, indian api players who are either graduating to becoming a formulations player or they are uh, in increasing their dominance in the api players uh, play itself so uh, uh, this actually flows directly from our earlier uh, one of the earlier themes that we played which was a specialty chemical and we could we could see that happening uh, in the api as well so finally apis are also chemicals and uh, uh, the supply chain the difference between the supply chain was uh, in specialty chemicals uh, indian companies were focused on niche opportunities while the scale and uh, mass scale was being addressed by china in api uh, the difference is the uh, advanced in intermediates advanced intermediates and the key starting material is what the, the china was addressing and the late stage apis and formulations is where india is strong so this particular uh, area was clear to us that api plays uh, api companies in india will have a huge tailwind going forward because india wants to reduce its dependence on china not only india the world wants to reduce its dependence on china uh, in terms of uh, uh, the key starting raw materials or intermediates and even china wants to reduce its dependence on polluting 
sectors or they want to uh, let go of the bottom 5% so china has about uh, 35 40% of the world's market share and they are willing to let go of the bottom 5 7% uh, you know to retain their uh, higher level uh, dominance so uh, but for a country like india which is 3% of the world a 5 7% market share shift is like doubling or tripling of the sector so that's exactly uh, what is going to pan out is already happening and is going to pan out indian players are going to backward integrate uh, and uh, they are going to not only manufacture for domestic purpose but they are also going to uh, supply to the world more and more indian players will go from being uh, number 2 uh, second vendor to the world to the uh, to the big pharma to being the lead uh, supplier so more companies should uh, we'll see champions emerging out of this space as well and in absolute terms these companies were available at uh, really uh, cheap valuations whether it is uh, i mean i don't think there is a single player barring uh, a dvs which is of any size uh, and uh, i think that is the reason that got us, that got us excited on the api plays on the us generic revival uh, the pricing erosion had uh, kind of stopped since 2018 19 uh and there due to covid there were some shortages also created and price inflation actually uh, became and it also provided some added demand of new new products like remdesivir and uh, favipravir and suddenly they start these products started contributing to the players so uh, this growth came out of nowhere uh, there was a perception about a year and a half back where indian generic was being you know denigrated that uh, is a bottle of lies and uh, we don't follow the ethical and uh, in standards that are required for manufacturing i think uh, i mean if some investor paid heed to it i think he would have uh, kind of uh, lost out on a golden opportunity to uh, visual i mean what was going to happen is what is already happening which is we are now providing the vials of uh, life and no no more bottles of lies and we are uh, now the pharmacy to the world so clearly uh, indian companies have a big role to play in the pharma chain across the world and it is here to stay apart from it pharma is one sector where india has some global dominance and competitiveness so there will be winners out of this and one has to keep their eyes and ears open for those opportunities okay but you you prefer api players more uh, i mean the 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 lorises and, and and some of the others or do you think that uh, there are other opportunities which are better yeah so uh, just give me a second yeah so uh, it is not preferring one over the other but uh, okay. yes loris is something that we picked uh, less okay, than a year back okay it's loris ah. <laughs> yeah so we did pick so again sorry disclaimer uh so our, uh clients and we might have interest and we might act like contrary to whatever gets discussed over here so the point being that uh, this i just want to understand ravi why 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 a loris forget forget it's not a recommendation from your end just let's try and understand yeah right so uh, i happen to know uh, mr uh, uh, chawa satyanarayan from the days of matrix labs and uh, matrix labs was one of our investment way back in 2000 uh, Four five. So we knew about his capabilities, and he took a break in two thousand six seven. Did a couple, two years MBA at ISB, and then he set up his own company. We had been uh, tracking his uh, uh, progress as a company. There were private equity players who had funded him, and uh, yes, he had leveraged himself personally and the company to achieve the scale that he has today. So now, uh, see the. uh problem most of the people had with loris was the uh, excess leverage and uh, at that point of time uh, the capacity stayed unutilized and they were carrying a lot of opex which was actually uh, understating the profits and the profitability so uh, once the once it became clear that the capex and the debt had peaked and the uh, covid provided the impetus for that extra boost there was one particular drug uh, dtg doltagravir in antiretrovirals uh, which was becoming the standard of 
therapy in uh, AIDS, and it was replacing an old product uh, of theirs. So the kind of adoption and the kind of pricing that they got in this particular product, uh, you know, gave them this fantastic boost in profitability in the last few quarters. Having said that, that is not the only engine that they have. Now they have built-in other engines as well. See, when you are picking an API players, what you need is somebody who is good in their processes, who can cut down on cost. There will always be pressure on the cost, but you have to be ahead of the curve in terms of uh, doing custom synthesis and process chemistry, cutting down on the process cost, and in fact, passing on voluntarily your cost savings to the uh, your uh, clients. So why does, uh, so if I were to give an example of DVs, DVs has uh, complete dominance in the five, six molecules that they have. Nobody can me uh, match their pricing. They have nearly 60% kind of, uh, even more probably price uh, uh, market share in naproxen. Similarly, uh, Loras was also built along those same lines. The kind of cost structure that they have and the kind of uh, cost savings that they do for the client is leading to them having 30, 40, 50% kind of market share in huge molecules and volume term. So you, what you need when you're picking an API player is the ability of the player to demonstrate their, uh, uh, you know, that they can dominate a particular market. So that is what excited us and uh, markets were worried about the leverage and we were sure that all they need is one good year and the leverage will be down to a very manageable level. And it also provided us with an added uh, uh, confidence that the promoter himself had leveraged to buy his own stock. So that, that gave you a lot of things that he truly believed in his own company and the opportunity. And we still don't know how this story will evolve. Today they are uh, still dominated by uh, APIs and antiretrovirals, but tomorrow the story could be biologics. It could be two, three years away, but it is a, they, he's already demonstrated that he can scale up. He can scale up the business. And uh, uh, I think that is a trait that I would look for in companies that where you believe that small company is going to become really big. I think uh, Loras has demonstrated that. Okay. So maybe we will try and go around looking at uh, businesses and entrepreneurs which can who can do that and of course within that right space um ravi uh, final couple of things um, and no conversation with about pharma can be over without talking about the ancillaries right and now we hear a lot of companies trying to speak about pharma great supplies and, and it's said with pride and it's almost spoken about in a way that it gives that company a slight edge some pricing power some specialty status it's happened in chemicals as you and i both know but you know gm fodler speaks very proudly about it about pharma and chemical grade supplies um, the other day we were talking to um, raj industries uh, and and you you must be knowing because it's one of your portfolio companies but they are talking about uh, supplying in a big way to um, the, uh, the the pharma space as well how do you look at the ancillary space it's a very large wide bucket uh, what do you like here uh, any, anything present in your portfolio that you can talk about? How did you go about and, you know, uh, sure, sure. Uh, so, buy that? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, again, a disclaimer that uh, it's a stock that we own and uh, it's been uh, fantastic. Which uh, one? Which one is this? Pra Praj Industries okay, is okay, one Praj. stock that okay. we own. Hmm. However, we do not look at this company through the lens of uh, pharma ancillary, so to say. I think there are many engines. So this particular company, uh, again, I have a history with this particular company since the earlier cycle uh, when uh, you know I, I used to work at Rare Enterprises and Rakesh had invested in Praj. At that point of time, we had this ethanol cycle and uh, there was a huge debate uh, of food versus fuel. And uh, at that point of time, crude had gone to $200 and then it collapsed and it looked like that ethanol story was done and dusted and buried. But what this company did, uh, it pivoted from being an ethanol company to focusing entirely on R&D on sustainable materials. So uh, it has many, many uh, R&D projects running, whether it is bioplastics, whether it is uh, you know marine biologics, whether it is uh, high purity grade uh, pharma intermediates, or uh, for that matter, ethanol 
or compressed biogas. So this company uh, spent the past ten, better part of the last 10 years spending nearly 40% of their profit on R&D. Uh, and uh, that, that just shows you that most people confuse this as an ethanol play, as a play on sugar cycle, or as a play on uh, uh, you know equipment sell, shower, being the shovel seller in the ethanol opportunity. But this is a company that has an R&D uh, DNA of an R&D company. So I have no way of uh, telling you which products will succeed and to what extent. But all I can say tell you is that they have seeded a lot of uh, possibilities, and which possibilities eventually do materialize and to what extent remains to be seen. But even at this point of time, if we just focus on ethanol and compressed biogas as the two opportunities that are uh, likely to materialize over the horizon of three, four years, then uh, uh, the, it, the stock was available at, again, sub 2000 crore kind of a market cap. So, uh, 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 and again, I mean, uh, what we are going to witness is that at least, uh, you know, 20,000 crore kind of opportunity is going to be uh, panning out in the next two to three years. Uh, I don't know what kind of market share Praj will eventually end up getting, but that is the kind of addressable opportunity for them. Once you have identified an opportunity that is so large and a company that is, uh, you know, uh, barely 2000 crores in size uh, addressing that opportunity, then you have to give it a long runway. You bet on it and see how things pan out. Uh, things are panning out better than expected uh, uh, for uh, us at this point of time. But uh, again, very exciting times. The kind of product, and I think last week there was one particular announcement where they spoke about uh, making bitumen from uh, you know sustainable material. So again, essentially, this is this company is doing a lot of good for the world. So uh, you you want them to succeed. Uh, you know, it is truly. Uh, a sustainable company in that sense. Mm, yeah, that's true. And I think I think the analogy is great that if the market cap is so low and if they have a large addressable opportunity, then that's great. But just before we wrap up, Ravi, uh, uh, my final question would be this, that uh, still I'm, I'm trying to understand that what about the pockets which are addressing uh, the complex ecosystem so i call pharmaceuticals a bit of a complex ecosystem because it's irreplaceable very critical and there are places and, and companies which are contributing to that there are companies for example i mean we are a digitally connected world and there are companies which are um, servicing that side of the bucket and i'm not talking about traditional it services but new so whatever within that pharma it telecom what have you but what about the servicing companies or companies which are not in the principal business but doing this, how do you go and pick out winners and losers there? So clearly there is a dearth of opportunities in the digitization space that you are talking about. Uh, but digitization as a theme is here to stay. Uh, and today here we are doing this interview over the Zoom call. I don't think 18 months back we could imagine that. And uh, all the businesses, and I said in the second wave, the businesses are doing just fine. Uh, supply chains are not disrupted. Again, it is a, a large part uh, due to the fact that business can be conducted over mobile and Zoom calls and uh, the physical and the logistics part is reduced to the bare minimum. So uh, digitization theme uh, was al already present even prior to uh, COVID hitting. But what COVID did is it accelerated. It uh, What Satya Nadella said is essentially it uh, whatever's to happen in uh, next two years got done in next three months or what is going to happen in the next 20 years is probably going to be bunched up in the next two to four years. So uh, there are, and the beauty of the business models around the digitization is that they are low capital, uh, their capital requirement is low. Uh, so, and uh, it is a transaction based fractional uh, eco uh, fractional transaction based uh, business model so so for example uh, one of the player that we own in the cpas place which is a communication platform as a service is root mobile and they are for uh, every uh, transaction that you do online uh, whenever there is a two factor authentication or whenever there is a, some kind of a communication from a business to you on whatsapp or sms there, there is a third party uh, platform involved in sending you that message and they are getting paid 
10 paise to 1 rupee depending on what service and what uh, what kind of technology that they are using and there are billions and billions of transactions happening this is the kind of quasi play that you would have for companies like amazon google whatsapp uh, or uh, microsoft all these companies are growing growing digitally and their their target opportunity is 7 billion people they are not thinking in terms of geography and these guys are kind of uh, attached to uh, that particular uh, company's growth so in they don't have the time or they don't have the competency to go and deal with uh, 200 300 telco providers worldwide worldwide and uh, you know negotiate a price and provide uh, or create their own platform so that's why this third party vendors of platform service providers exist today and it's a space that is growing very very fast and we have seen this story play out in us uh, whether it is uh, software as a service or for that matter so many other uh, as a service model are there and i believe uh, not only the company that we have bet on but in the, over the next 12 to 24 months a lot many more companies from private space will be entering and uh, that those will be exciting opportunities now obviously you are not going to get uh, those companies cheap but uh, it is going to be there will be some winners even out of those uh, overpriced uh, uh, technology play that will be coming for IPO. So you need to do your picking, stock picking over there as well, because there are some business models that you have to, uh, again, the benchmark remains the same. You have to see what the addressable opportunity is and whether this uh, particular player has a competitive advantage and what is the absolute valuation you are getting it at. And if you see that the risk reward is still in favor, then it would be a good time to go ahead and bet on uh, these business models. Just final question, Ravi. And since you mentioned risk reward, I think it's pertinent. I'm sure you also want to talk about this. Um, is that uh, when when the valuations would have been very attractive for some of these names, when you might have picked them, I have no idea about that. But how do you decide when to sell or when will you decide when to sell these? Would it be a factor of valuations having become more expensive, very, very expensive and because of the run up that has happened? Or is it something around the management not executing well i know it could be a combination of a lot of factors but what would be the single biggest factor because in a most of these companies that you've spoken about or maybe some of your other peers would have bought in the run-up at times has been very very swift as was the case in praj uh, last month as was the case in root mobile maybe earlier in the year or was the case with loris labs for the last 12 months so how do you decide when to get out of these companies no, I think uh, that is a very, very pertinent question. And uh, uh, that is something that we struggle with on a daily basis as well. So, uh, but one thing is very clear. See, uh, do not get swayed by the current P multiple. A lot of people, it's not like we are not paying heat to it. For a company, uh, let's say like Root Mobile, it's probably trading at a multiple upwards of uh, 50. But if the growth, last year's growth was 54, 55%. And if the next year's growth is anywhere close to that, then you will see that these multiples uh, are not going to contract in a hurry as long as the growth sustains. Now, it is always a difficult call that when is this, how long is this growth going to sustain and when it is going to taper off. So uh, the model or the framework that we use is that we keep comparing the opportunity from a rolling three to five year point of view with the valuation that it is being trading at, absolute market cap valuation that it is trading at. So for example, if the global uh, CPAS opportunity is a $60 billion opportunity and uh, it is growing at uh, 30% and it is this particular player is available at $1.5 billion and there is a possibility that they can be in the top 10 service provider of the world, I think there is still a large scope available. Uh, now this large scope uh, needs to be uh, proven by them delivering on the growth front every now and then. The growth can be organic as well as inorganic. So they have the balance sheet. In fact, they have a stated intent of uh, going out and acquiring, acquiring new technologies, acquiring clients and new geographies. So uh, the space remains large and this company can still remain large. So giving, uh, getting scared by the current valuations, uh, current earnings multiple, will uh, probably be a disservice and uh, one should stay focused on a three to five year rolling absolute uh, opportunity size. I hope that answers your question.
it does ravi and and, and in fact uh, in this whole uh, show there is uh, as much as we've used examples to to explain the points i think some of the investing um, philosophies have turned out really well so thank you for that um i wish you a lot of success and safe health ravi uh, to you and your team and everybody around and wish thank you, you so much for joining in today and giving us some of the thoughts about how you structure your portfolio great thank you so much thanks niraj pleasure was ours ravi and viewers thanks for tuning into this edition of the talking point